So today I'll be talking about uh, the self-amplification of strain as a possible mechanism uh, for finite time blow up for the Navier-Stokes equation. And so um, I'll be going through, this is the first uh, installment of the postdoc seminar at the Fields Institute Program of Mathematical Hydrodynamics. I'm one of the, the postdocs for the program, uh, and also postdoc at Master University working there at Sawyer. Um, so I'll be going over uh, sort of some of the background on the Navier-Stokes equations, uh, the role of the strain in Navier-Stokes analysis, and then I'll talk about a model equation for the evolution of the strain, where we do have finite time blow up, and some perturbative results from that. So I just have to admit someone from the waiting room. So the, uh, sorry. So the Navier-Stokes equation is given by delta T u minus Laplace u plus u dot grad u plus grad p is zero. And we also have a, a constraint that the divergence of u is zero. And so these are the equations for incompressible flow where density is constant. Uh, so the first equation expresses Newton's uh, second law, F equals ma. So delta t u plus u dot grad u is the acceleration of the Lagrangian frame. And Laplace u minus grad p is the force uh, divided by the mass. So the Laplace u, I, I set viscosity to be one because you can treat it as a scaling parameter. Uh, we'll be working on the whole space. Um, and so it, it's simplest just to take it to be one. Um, I'll note, so the Laplace U uh, represents viscous forces, so it's the sort of internal friction of the fluid, and uh, the gradient P is the gradient pressure. The acceleration in the Lagrangian frame is because uh, our equations for motion, the acceleration is the acceleration of a particle. So delta T U is the change of velocity at a certain point, but it's not the acceleration of the particle at that point. Because as the particle moves through space, uh, even if you have a, say, so suppose you have a flow that's con entirely constant in time, you still have acceleration of, and deceleration of particles. As the flow is getting slower, if you follow a given particle, it's going to be slowing down. And so our force is acting on it. Uh, even if there's not acceleration uh, at, at an ins in the sort of Eulerian frame where we're looking at the velocity at each point in the flow, there could be acceleration of, of the particles. And so that's where the, the advection term is coming from. Um, although the term is, the, the gradient of pressure term is not essential in defining a solution because it can be eliminated by using the Helmholtz projection. So we take the projection of this equation onto divergence-free vector fields. Uh, U and delta T U and minus the plus U are already divergence-free. So uh, the Helmholtz projection will kill off the gradient of pressure and just leave us with the projection of this. Um, and it's worth noting the two main notions of solutions uh, Lorey Hopp weak solutions and mild solutions can both be defined entirely without any reference to a pressure function. So the first notion uh, of solution for the Navier-Stokes equation was developed by Lorey in 1934 in like a really uh, pioneering work in ACTA. Um, so Luray proved that for all uh, initial data in L2, uh, divergence-free, there exists a global and time weak solution. So it's, uh, it's L infinity in time and L2 in space. And in fact, it's weakly continuous in time, although not necessarily strongly continuous, um, because we have a, it's a solution in the sense of integrating against test functions. So the continuity is the continuity in terms of uh, distributions. Uh, and it's also L2 in time and H1 in space. And such solutions have to satisfy an energy inequality that for all t greater than zero, uh, this is the energy at a given time, one half the L2 norm of u squared. This is one half mv squared where m is just sort of normalized to be one in the density, um, you set the density to be one. And this is the amount of energy dissipated due to viscosity. Um, now for a smooth solution, this is an energy equality. Um, we can use the fact that uh, the pressure is orthogonal, the gradient of pressure is orthogonal to U in L2, and the advection term doesn't change the L2 norm. 
uh, to get this to be an equality. Um, but when you pass to weak limits, so the way Leray proves this is there's a, he, he gives smooth solutions to a mollified problem and passes to weak limits. And when you pass to weak limits, you end up with an inequality um, because you only have sort of inequalities in terms of the norms once you pass to weak limits. So these sorts of solutions are known to exist uh, globally in time, what Leray called uh, turbulent solutions, but are not known to be either smooth or unique. So another notion of solutions uh, was developed by uh, Caro and Fujita in 1964. Um, and they developed the notion of mild solutions to Navier-Stokes equations, which is based on the heat semigroup. Uh, so mild solutions satisfy this equation, where we sort of subtract over the advection term to the other side in the sense of convolution with the heat kernel, as in Duhamel's formula. So if we have delta T u minus Laplace u equals f, some, ex, some given force, we have an explicit formula for that. And so if we plug minus the Helmholtz projection of u dot rad u into that formula and we get equality, then it's a mild solution. And sort of using a contraction mapping principle, uh, you can prove that there have to exist solutions uh, and that they have to be unique. So mild solutions must be smooth and unique, but they may only exist locally in time for initial data in H1. Um, and that's because sort of our contraction mapping argument um, requires that the time step be short, be small relative to the size of the H1 norm. Um, and so if the H1 norm is large, then the contraction mapping argument. Sorry, just admitting someone from the waiting room. Um, the contraction mapping argument uh, will only uh, work uh, if the time step is small enough. Um, and the problem is we don't actually have a control on the H1 norm. Right, so the essential problem is that we have two real bounds, um, both that come from the energy equality for smooth solutions, that we have a bound, a uniform bound in time of the L2 norm, and we know that the H1 norm is square integrable in space, and that comes precisely from, from this inequality. Um, but both those bounds are super critical with respect to the natural scaling of the Navier-Stokes equation. So the Navier-Stokes equation is invariant under this rescaling, that if u is a solution of the Navier-Stokes equation, then so is u lambda for all positive lambda. Um, but the critical norm here would be L3, not L2. We can control energy, but energy is not a strong enough quantity in three dimensions. In two dimensions, energy is scale critical, and we do have global smooth solutions. But in three dimensions, it's not, it's not strong enough. So the initial data u naught is small in a scale critical space, such as L3, which was proved by Kato in 1984, or BMO minus one, which was proved by Koch and Tatar in 2001, then there has to be a global smooth solution. Uh, likewise, we can guarantee the existence, the global existence of a smooth solution if we have control on some scale critical norm. So Ladozhenska, Prady, and Saren proved uh, in a series of separate papers that if t max is less than plus infinity, where t max is the maximal time of existence for a smooth solution. So this means if there's finite time blow up at some time t max, uh, then for all two over p plus three over q equals one, or three between q and infinity, including infinity but not including three, then the integral, then the sort of uh, the LP in time, LQ in space norm has to uh, be infinite. That if we have a bound on the L LP in time, LQ in space norm, then there's fine. Then we can say that the solution can be extended uh, to a greater time. Um, and so this was extended uh, by Escoriaza, Seregan, and Schwerach in 2003 to the endpoint case. Uh, they showed that it, the L3 norm has to go to infinity as you approach below the time. Um, so these are sort of conditional results guaranteeing regularity, but we have no idea if any of these quantities are actually controlled or not. Um, that remains uh, fundamentally wide open. 
So two other crucially important objects to the Navier-Stokes equation are the strain matrix, uh, Sij is, and so this, and the vorticity. So the strain is the symmetric part of the gradient. Vorticity is a vector, but it's a vector in, in three dimensions, but it's a vector representation of the anti-symmetric part of the gradient. So uh, three by three anti-symmetric matrices have three degrees of freedom because the diagonal is solved to be zero and the off diagonals are determined in terms of each other. So you can represent an anti-symmetric matrix as a, uh, as the vorticity, as a vector. And then multiplication by that matrix is like the cross product with the vector um, for any V. And so while the velocity describes how the fluid is advected, so if you start at a certain point, where do you move to? The vorticity describes how it's rotated and the strain describes how it's deformed. So if you start with a sphere, and you look at how the sphere is, is moved by the flow, is affected by the flow, um, for a very short time, the way the sphere is stretched or compressed is going to be given by the strain matrix. So the vorticity has been studied fairly exhaustively, but there's been a lot less study on the strain. And in fact, most of the study of the strain has been on how it affects the vorticity. So the evolution equation for the vorticity is given by delta t omega minus the plus omega, plus u dot grad omega minus s omega equals zero. Um, so you have a dissipation term, a viscous dissipation term, you have an advection term, and you have a vortex stretching term. Uh, and so how the vorticity and the strain interact uh, has been the subject of a lot of study, but the role of the strain itself has been studied less. So the evolution equation for the strain is a bit longer. Sorry, what was, you wrote s, s omega, is that, uh, matrix application? Yes, yeah, so S is S times omega. Yeah, yeah, it's just a matrix multiplication. Okay, so as vectors, that would be the cross product? Um, no, because uh, a, a omega would be the cross product, but S can't be represented as a vector. Uh, so the oh. anti-symmetric part has a vector representation, but the symmetric part has uh, more degrees of freedom than that. I see, okay, okay, sorry. No, 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 good question. Um, and I'll note, this is usually represented as omega dot grad u, um, which is the vector which can be represented in matrix terms as grad u times omega, but a times omega is omega cross omega, or I guess technically it's one half omega cross omega, but that's zero, of course. And so that's why we can write the omega dot grad u term as s omega here. It's because a times omega, the anti-symmetric chart times omega is omega cross itself, and so it's zero. So the evolution equation for the strain is a bit more complicated. So we still have viscous dissipation term. We have an advection term. We have a quadratic nonlinear that's like S squared, and we have a quadratic nonlinear that's like omega squared. It's like omega tensor omega. And then we have two terms that are actually uh, in the orthogonal complement. So we have minus one quarter omega squared times the identity matrix, and we have plus the Hessian of pressure. So this is an evolution equation in the constraint space uh, L2ST, which is the symmetric gradient of divergence free vector fields in homogeneous H1. So if we take all the vector fields in H1 and we take their symmetric gradients, we get this new constraint space. Um, I've been, Eric and I have been working on sort of like a Helmholtz uh, decomposition to try to describe the constraint space a bit more. I, I'll get into that a little bit if I have time, but there will be a ton of time to discuss yeah. that. But some basic properties to note is that the trace of S is the divergence of U, because the diagonal elements of S are delta 1, U1, delta 2, U2, uh, delta 3, U3. Um, and so the trace of S has to be zero. So for every S in our constraint space, L2, ST, the, the strain space, uh, S has to be trace free. We can also show that the sum over IJ of del I, del J, SIJ is zero. Um, and so I, I proved in a paper in ARMA in 2020 that um, F times scalar multiples of the identity and Hessians of H2 functions are orthogonal to the constraint space uh, always. So um, this fact 
this being orthogonal to the constraint space just comes from the fact that S is trace free. So if it's trace free, it's inner product with any scalar multiple identity will just be the integral of F times its trace, which is just always going to be identically zero. Now, uh, Hessians being orthogonal is just a generalization of the fact that gradients are orthogonal to divergence free vector fields. So if our constraint space is divergence free vector fields, we're orthogonal to gradients. When we move up to symmetric gradients of divergence free vector fields, we're now going to be orthogonal to Hessians. Uh, and that's, you can show that fairly straightforwardly just integrating by parts. This means in particular the strain equation can be rewritten as delta Ts minus Laplace s plus the projection of u dot grad s plus s squared plus one quarter omega tensor omega is zero. And so sort of two key lemmas that I'll use. One is that the integral of trace s cubed plus three quarters of s omega tensor omega is equal to trace of grad u cubed. Um, so this fact is just a straightforward uh, matrix algebra. Uh, you just write grad u equals s plus a and you take the cube and, and, and use the products of trace and you get that. And the fact that this is zero comes from the divergence free constraint. You can integrate by parts and show that if u is divergence free, uh, then the integral of the trace of grad u cubed is zero. There's another fact we'll use which is that for any trace-free symmetric three by three matrix, the trace of M cubed is three times the determinant of M. Uh, and this, you just write out what trace of M cubed is and you sub in minus lambda one, minus lambda two for lambda three. And the, if you just write out both of these in terms of uh, the eigenvalues and you use the trace-free constraint, it follows essentially immediately. And so with those two things in mind, we have the following result. That for all S uh, mild solution to the Navier-Stokes strain equation, then the L2 norm of S behaves like minus two SH dot one squared minus four times the integral of the determinant of S. And so our vortex stretching term, which involves this non-locality because uh, S omega tensor omega. So this is an identity for entropy growth. The standard identity for entropy growth involves S omega tensor omega, and that um, is also cubic in terms of omega in the same way. So the determinant's cubic in terms of S, but it has this Riesz transform, right? Because to get the strain in terms of, that the strain and the vorticity totally determine each other, because you can invert the strain to get velocity and you can invert vorticity to get velocity. And then you can take either the correlative symmetric gradient to get from vorticity to strain or from strain to vorticity. Um, however, there's a Riesz transform. So, um, you know, it's, it's nice on L2, but once you're trying to do these sort of integral estimates, it's, it's, very, it's very nasty. Um, and so the result relies on the above lemma and sort of three key facts. So the fact is that the first fact is that S is orthogonal to one third S squared plus one quarter omega tensor omega, because this is the integral of one third trace S cubed plus one quarter S omega tensor omega. And this is the quantity we just showed is zero. And also the invection term doesn't contribute at all to the L2 norm. And so the only term that contributes is the two thirds S squared, right? We've eliminated one third of the S squared, we have two thirds left. And that gives us minus four thirds the integral of trace s cubed, and therefore minus four the determinant of s. Now this identity is nice because it's local. It's also nice because it tells us exactly what kind of structures we need to have a blow up. So because lambda one is always going to be non-positive and lambda three is always going to be non-negative. Um, so here, lambda one, lambda two, and lambda three are the eigenvalues of the strain in order. So if lambda one is less than or equal to lambda two, is less than or equal to lambda three. We know that S is trace free. And so that means that the, we can't have three positive eigenvalues and we can't have three negative eigenvalues. And so minus lambda one, lambda three is always going to be greater than or equal to zero, which means that this quantity, which is minus four times the integral of lambda one times lambda two times lambda three, its sign will be completely determined by the sign of this middle eigenvalue, lambda two. So when lambda two is positive, we have two positive eigenvalues, one negative eigenvalue, and so this whole thing is positive. When lambda two is negative, 
you have two negative eigenvalues, one very positive eigenvalue, this whole term is, is negative. And so because of that, we have a regularity criteria in terms of the positive part of the middle eigenvalue of strain. Um, so if we have a mild solution to the Navier-Stokes equation, where 2 over p plus 3 over q is 2, so this is scale critical, <coughs> um, because for the eigenvalues of strain, they scale like the gradient. So L3 halves becomes critical instead of L3 as the endpoint, just because of sort of like Sobolev embedding. If we control any of these uh, scale critical time and space estimates on second part of lambda two, then we have regularity. So if you have finite time blow up, all of these uh, scale critical norms have to blow up in terms of the second part of the, in terms of the positive part of the middle eigenvalue. And so this was first proven by Neustupa and Pennell in 2001 and using different methods by myself in uh, 2020. And so this has a real geometric interpretation in that uh, what this says is that for there to be blow up, we need there to be uh, planar stretching and uh, axial compression. So we need, to be compre we need to be stretching in two directions and compressing much more strongly in a third. Um, and so that tells us something about sort of what the local structure uh, of blow up has to look like. So in the last section, we showed that the inner product of S with the projection of one third S squared plus one quarter omega tensor omega was zero, right? S is in our constraint space, so we can add this projection on and, and the identity is still zero. And also that the inner product of S with the advection term is zero. Um, this is true from integration by parts. The U is divergence free, so if you integrate by parts, you get that the term is the negative of itself. So as long as you have enough regularity to integrate by parts, this will always be zero. And so with this in mind, we will rewrite the Navier-Stokes strain equation in this way that looks kind of weird. So we'll write delta Ts minus Laplace S, the advection term, plus two thirds the projection of S squared, plus the projection of one third S squared plus one quarter omega tensor omega, plus the projection of the advection term equals zero. Now, this is a, uh, sort of an odd way to write the equation, but the idea is that we're going to drop the two terms that, can, that are orthogonal to S. So we have two terms here that don't contribute to the growth of entropy, um, right? They, they, they contribute to the change of the dynamics. So whether or not entropy blows up in finite time is, is impacted by these terms, but they're not contributing to the change of the L2 norm of S at all. Um, and so because of that, we're going to drop those two terms and we're going to have a model equation for the self-amplification of strain, delta Ts minus Laplace S plus two-thirds, the projection of S squared is zero. Sorry, I got to get, let someone in from the waiting room. Um, is this change um, sort of, is this a, a, are we now looking at a toy problem or is this, um, like a projection of the original problem. Oh, so yeah, this is a toy model. Um, okay. So this is a toy model, but it has some properties uh, that make mm -hmm. it relatively close to, uh, to the problem, but it's definitely, it's a toy problem. Uh, one of the advantages is because most of the toy models don't involve dropping terms. Um, we can get some conditional blow up results for the whole equation uh, by looking at the perturbative regime, uh, which is something I'll get to soon, but this is very much a toy model. Uh, and there's not really much physical justification for this. It's very much more on the, on the mathematical side. So suppose we have a mild solution to the strain model equation. Then we have the same identity for entropy growth. So entropy is like the one half, the L2 norm of vorticity, or the L2 norm of the gradient U. It can also be expressed as the L2 norm squared of uh, the strain. And so we have this identity for entropy growth which is the same as the identity we had for the Navier-Stokes equation. So this equation has, has the same identity for entropy growth, and consequently, it has the same regularity criterion. So this equation, we also have a regularity criteria in terms of the positive part of lambda two. 
So we have, a, we have a model equation for how strain evolves that respects the energy, uh, that respects the identity for uh, the growth of entropy. Um, and so I'll note that one of the big model equations, uh, there is a model equation developed by Terry Tao that respects the energy equality. And so this is doing for sort of entropy and in terms of the strain dynamics, uh, what the Tau model equation was doing for velocity and the energy equality. Because the energy equality is generally expressed in sort of integral form, because it's a very easy uh, inequality to integrate, but it is a differential inequality, right? You can state the energy equality as you know, the derivative of one half the L2 norm of u squared is minus the gradient of u, you know, L2 norm squared. So, so we, what this concludes in particular is that using the constraint space and the regularity criterion in terms of the positive part of lambda two, you can't get regularity using just those pieces. Because here we have an evolution equation on the constraint space that has this regularity criterion and it exhibits finite time blow up. And so again, the, our equation is just uh, for, for those who just joined, this is uh, the, our equation is that the time evolution of S uh, has a dissipation term and a quadratic term that's the projection of S squared onto the strain constraint space. So the main theorem, uh, so this is a paper submitted uh, in January of this year. The main theorem is that if we have a mild solution to the strain model equation, such that at initial time, the H1 norm squared minus eight thirds the determinant of S is positive, then there's finite time blow up. And in particular, we have uh, an estimate on the upper bound for blow up time, T max is less than four over three F naught, where F naught is this function. So basically what this says is that the, uh, the, the quadratic, the cubic nonlinearity has to beat the quadratic dissipation. And as long as it does at initial times, you will blow up in finite time. Uh, we need a little bit of extra, right? In the sense that for n to be increasing, we need minus two, the H1 norm squared of S, minus four, the determinant to be positive. To guarantee finite time blow up, we, need, we have to replace the four with an eight thirds. So we need to beat it with some room to spare. Um, but as long as we do that, uh, there will be finite time blow up. And so I won't, I, I won't have time to go through all of the proof, but the proof is relatively straightforward. So I, I will sort of sketch out uh, how the arguments go. So the main uh, idea of the proof is we set f of t to be equal to minus two s h dot one squared minus eight thirds the integral of the term of s over the L2 norm of s. Uh, and if we do that, we can show just using the quotient rule and Hilda's inequality with exponents two and two, um, that if f of t is greater than zero, then delta t f of t is greater than or equal to three quarters f of t squared. And so clearly if f naught is positive, we can integrate this differential inequality and guarantee blow up. So as long as f naught is positive, there's finite time blow up um, just from integrating the differential inequality. And the way we get this identity, that if f of t is positive, then delta t f of t is greater than three quarters f of t squared, is there's sort of two key pieces. So the first thing is that if we take the minus two sh dot one squared minus four of the return of s, this is minus two, the inner product of minus Laplace s plus two thirds s squared times uh, inner product with s. Because uh, those are sort of the two terms that are contributing to our n to be growth. Then if we take this inner product, this gives us minus two s h dot one squared minus uh, we drop the projection and use the fact that s is symmetric. That gives us minus four thirds trace s cubed. And using some identities for symmetric uh, trace free matrices, we can get minus four determinant of s. And if we apply Holder's inequality to this, the Holder's inequality to this, we get this is less than or equal to two times, well, the L2 norm of this piece and the L2 norm of this piece. Um, the other fact is that if we take the derivative in time of minus two sh dot one squared minus eight thirds, the integral of the term of s, 
we get four times minus Laplace s plus two thirds the projection of s squared L2 squared. And that's where this eight thirds is coming from. Uh, that we want to get the derivative of this quantity to be positive. And if we pick eight thirds correctly, if we pick the constant out in front of this correctly, we can get minus Laplace s plus two thirds s squared inner product with itself. And so the, the constant eight thirds is, is chosen to make this work out. And then applying the equality above, we can say that this quantity is greater than or equal to uh, minus two sh dot one squared minus four to turn s quantity squared over SL2 squared. And this is where our quadratic uh, blow up is coming from, right? That our derivative of this quantity gets bound, is, bounded is equal to this, and it's bounded below by this squared. And that's enough that we can get, uh, just uh, doing a little bit more algebra, these are the, really the two key steps, the, the rest of it sort of just bookkeeping with coefficients. Um, and that gives us finite time blow up. Uh, that, that gives us, in particular, that, that's what gives us that delta t f of t is greater than or equal to 3 quarters uh, f of t squared. Okay, so that's, that's nice. This is, uh, well, okay, before I, before I talk about the perturbative results, I should talk about some other model equations that have been proposed. Uh, so Montgomery Smith uh, developed a scalar model equation for the Navier-Stokes equation in 2001 with finite time blow up. And so this equation, delta t u minus a plus u plus the projection of the divergence of u tensor u. So this should be an equal zero there. Because um, this is the same as u dot grad u. So divergence, u is divergence free. So when we take the divergence of u tensor u, we just get u dot grad u. This operator is replaced with minus the plus to the one half. And u tensor u is replaced with u squared. So you just have a scalar, a scalar model. And uh, Gallagher and Paiku uh, generalize this result to the correct constraint space, divergence free vector fields. Um, but it still sort of has the same flavor as the scalar model equation. It doesn't really have the structure of uh, Navier-Stokes in most ways beyond the same sort of scaling laws. Um, but the, by changing the Fourier multiplier in this a little bit and, and getting a matrix of multipliers, you can sort of generalize the scalar blowout model to a blowout model that works for divergence free vector fields as well. Um, and then finally, uh, most recently in 2016, Tao uh, proved blow up for a model equation that respects the energy inequality. And so this B tilde is a replacement of uh, the projection of the, of the divergence of U tensor U. Uh, so the projection of U dot grad U that has a number of properties. So its L2 norm is controlled by the L4 norm of U and the L4 norm of grad U. So that's the same as, the, as for the Navier-Stokes equation. And it's orthogonal to you, which is what gets you the energy equality. And so, so Tau's result sort of shows that we have, and so this operator B tilde is very hard to describe, but it's sort of a Fourier averaged version of the Navier-Stokes, the actual Navier-Stokes operator. Um, and so that's uh, what the Tau model really shows is the energy equality can't help us with regularity. So we know the energy equality is, is super critical. And so that uh, gives us, this, that's a certain uh, barrier. But this sort of shows definitively that you can have the energy equality and you can have the same harmonic analysis estimates for the nonlinearity, and you can have finite time blow up. So just doing harmonic analysis with sort of the energy equality and with uh, uh, the nonlinear term is not going to get you regularity for the Navier Stokes equation. So now I'll talk about sort of a perturbative result. Um, so suppose we have a mild solution, an H2 mild solution in Navier Stokes equation, such that minus 2 sh dot 1 squared minus 8 thirds the integral determinant of s is positive. And for all t up to the blow up time, we have that 3, the projection of the invection term plus the 1 third s squared plus 1 quarter omega tensor omega term squared over 2 times this term from our model equation, L2 norm squared, is less than or equal to kappa is less than 1. So we need this term to be bounded below. We need this term to be sort of ratio of these two norms to be less than 2 thirds. And we need it to be bounded away from 2 thirds not just less than two thirds, we need a gap. 
then there has to be finite time flow up. And the proof of this result is essentially the same as the proof for the model equation, um, but just uh, rather than dropping this term from our estimates, we keep track of all the things involving this term and we use this condition uh, to control it. And so what this says, uh, to go back to, go back a few slides. So basically we have this equation. This is the full Navier-Stokes equation. Right? This is the equation for the evolution of strain. Uh, and that, to because you can invert strain to get velocity and you can take the curl to get vorticity, this determines all of the dynamics. We're saying that if this term, these two terms, if the sum of these two terms is small relative to this term, then we do have blow up, uh, right? That the model equation can be extended a bit into the perturbative regime as long as the terms we're dropping are not too big relative to the terms we kept. And so this tells us something about uh, the self-amplication of strain, right? So it says that we know that the self-amplification of strain is a mechanism that can drive blow up it might be able to be canceled by these other terms, especially by advection. Uh, and so if we can control those other terms. If they're not too big, then there's finite time blow up. And so this tells us sort of what kind of structures we need in the fluids, how, how big S squared is relative to the advection of S and, and omega turns to omega in order to get blow up. And this is fairly significant because most of the there are a lot of regularity criteria that if we can control, if this quantity remains small enough, then there's regularity. And if there's blow up and this quantity has to become big, but this is one of the first results I know of where if a certain quantity is small enough and uh, sort of the ratio of two quantities is small enough, then there has to be finite time blow up. Um, now to actually compute, going back uh, to the slide we're on, to actually compute this is a total mess. Um, for one, solutions that are good candidates for blow up are hard to write down. Uh, turbulence is notoriously difficult to pin down. So anything you can write down in closed form is likely to be pretty laminar. Um, and so to write down a good candidate for blow up and then to compute the, this uh, quantity uh, by hand is, is pretty much miserable. Um, I think one approach would be to look at this numerically. Uh, to see whether or not this can be satisfied sort of locally in time, and then to look at, to look at the sort of uh, functions that satisfy this well locally in time, and then to try to simulate their dynamics as well as we can. But this is sort of a, a possible mechanism where strain self-amplification could lead to blow up. And so the proof is, uh, like I said, very similar to the proof of blow up for the model equation. You just have to keep track of the drop term and use the constraint, uh, the, con the sort of condition to track that. Um, I'll say that it's likely that the projection of one third S squared plus one quarter omega tensor omega will be small because there's an observed tendency that the vorticity tends to align with the eigenvector associated with uh, lambda two, the middle eigenvalue. So the, the dominant alignment for the vorticity is with the, with the middle eigenvector. And lambda two squared, so lambda two is the middle eigenvalue, but it's the smallest in magnitude. So lambda two squared is the smallest eigenvalue of S squared. And so when we add omega tensor omega, it pushes up the lambda two squared a bit. And this may be very close to being a multiple of the identity matrix. And hence, if it's a multiple of the identity matrix, then it's close to being in the constraint space. And so its projection is going to be small. It's close to being orthogonal to the constraint space. Uh, it's close to being an identity. And so its projection could be quite small. However, there's no clear mechanism for controlling the advection term. Uh, there's no nice way to control that at all. And that's uh, particularly significant because what, so one of the ways physically to interpret the model is that sort of the self-amplification of strain is uh, the nonlinearity from that is driving the equation towards finite time blow up. Um, but as strain gets really big, you can invert strain to get velocity. So big strains uh, produce huge velocities. And so the strains blowing up produces huge velocities that sort of tear apart the coherent structures before they can blow up the equation. That you, the, the advection can kind of pull the nonlinearity apart in physical space in a way that prevents the thing from blowing up in finite time, potentially. Um, 
Um, and this is uh, interesting that the main barrier to obtaining finite time blow up from our perturbative result is the invection term, because it's consistent with previous research on the Constantine, Max, Maida, and de Gregorio uh, 1D models for the vorticity equation uh, in which advection plays a, a regularizing role. The, the Constantine, Lax, Maida's uh, model is sort of a 1D model for the Euler equation where you replace the vortex stretching term with the Hilbert transform. So you replace a, a least type transform, a matrix of least transforms to the Hilbert transform in 1D. Um, and then the de, Gregorio, the, the de Gregorio model involves adding an advection term to that equation. And the advection term helps to make the equation a bit more regular in this model equation. And so this is sort of consistent with some other work on model equations uh, for the Navier Stokes equation. Um, also note, there's a paper that was published uh, very recently in uh, Journal of Fluid Mechanics Rapids. Um, this wasn't really what I, something I was thinking about when I was writing the paper. The paper came out uh, after I'd submitted it. But uh, Carboni and Bragg have a recent result that suggests uh, vortex stretching is in fact not the main contributor to the uh, average cascade, uh, talking about sort of the turbulent uh, energy cascade. The main contributor is the self-amplification of the strain rate field. Um, and there's been previous work uh, by Tsunober, especially in his book, uh, An Informal uh, Conceptual Introduction to Turbulence, that suggests strain amplification uh, as a mechanism behind the turbulent energy cascade. Um, and so it's interesting, this result uh, sort of is, is highly consistent with some of the stuff that had been in the fluid, more fluid mechanics focused literature, but hadn't really been formalized in uh, PDE terms yet. That the sort of the, the arguments in, in both of these cases are a bit more heuristic because they're getting, uh, when you're getting into the in detail into the structures of turbulence, it's very difficult to prove things formally because well, the structures, structures of turbulence are, are a bit of a mess. Um, so, I will leave it there, and uh, we have a little bit of time for questions, I think. Um, so you gave at one point a sort of geometric explanation of this, um, the, the, the second uh, eigenvalue. It's sort of this idea of like getting smaller in one direction and, and, and bigger in others or, or um that reminds me of vortex stretching is there like a close relationship between these phenomena yes um they're they're equivalent in the sense that uh so the vorticity is getting stretched um by the strain right like the strain matrix is what determines how the vortex gets to form and so the question with vortex stretching is how does the vorticity align with the strain rate matrix, right? If it aligns with positive eigenvalues, it's getting stretched, and so it's getting bigger. If it aligns with negative eigenvalues, it's getting smaller. Um, and in particular, the fact that lambda two is, uh, determines the sign has a consistency with vortex stretching because, so the vorticity mostly aligns with the middle eigenvalue, which means the middle eigenvalue is positive, the vorticity is mostly getting stretched. And if the middle eigenvalue is negative, it's mostly getting uh, uh, compressed. Um, but the idea is here is that sort of the advantage of the determinant identity, as opposed to the vortex stretching identity, is that the sign of the eigenvalues tells you everything. You don't need to know about alignment. You just need to know what the eigenvalues are. Um, whereas mm -hmm. with vortex stretching, because you have this non-locality, um, it's a bit tougher to see uh, what sort of structures you need. And so in particular, one of the things is like, okay, what should a vorticity look like that's getting stretched a lot? It's not at all clear how to write down something where there's a lot of stretching. Uh, but what should a determinant, what should a strain matrix look like for the minus the integral of the determinant to be large? Well, we want the structure minus two lambda, lambda, lambda. That's the biggest uh, the, the strain cell amplification term can get. Um, and that's something Eric and I have been working on uh, for a while, uh, whether or not this is possible in the constraint space. Uh, that's still an open mm -hmm. question, uh, whether or not we can have this minus two lambda, lambda, lambda structure. 
where lambda two is equal to lambda three, um, sort of throughout the whole space. Uh, it doesn't appear that it's possible, but it's quite difficult to nail down uh, a confirmation mm -hmm. that it's not. So if I'm understanding you, um, this, this quantity that uh, the, the, lamb, the positive part of the second eigenvalue, if that is small and integral that you know can blow up, that's because, that's because the, the strain matrix doesn't have the capacity to stretch. So like, if, if you found that quantity, then you also can say there isn't very much vortex stretching. Is that so, right? Yes. Well, I mean, uh, what it comes down to is, is this, actually. So the integral right. of trace s cubed plus 3 quarters, the integral of s tensor omega tensor omega is 0. Mm -hmm. And in particular, what that means is that s omega tensor omega equals minus 4 the integral determinant s. That the divergence-free constraint means we can express vortex stretching globally purely in terms of strain. Um, okay. so, so locally, we don't know this, right? Because you can't determine omega locally in terms of s. But globally, uh -huh. s omega tensor omega is minus 4 determinant s. This is exactly equal to s omega tensor omega uh, when we integrate over the whole space. As long as we're working on, if we're working on the whole space or on the torus, and it's also true on bounded domains if you're careful about boundary conditions. But the integration by parts has some issues in, in the case of bounded domains that you have to worry about. Um, and so basically, by getting a determinant representation for vortex stretching, we know clearly what the geometric structure we want is. Because basically, uh, the, the, sort of the reason the strain has these advantages over the vorticity is that um, matrices have a lot of algebraic structure that vectors don't, right? And, mm -hmm. uh, and symmetric matrices have an algebraic structure that anti-symmetric matrices don't. That you know, you square an anti-symmetric matrix, you get a symmetric matrix. You can't square a vector, but if you square a symmetric matrix, you get another symmetric matrix. And so the nonlinearity has a sort of better algebraic structure uh, in the strain formulation. Very cool. Thank you. Thank you. So I have a question about the result. So it seems like you exclude the, the endpoint Q equals three halves. Yes. So yeah. would you be, I mean, did you expect something like you said again is the uh, result in this saying or? So I think it's true, uh, but it's very <laughs> hard. So you can show the L3 halves norm is bounded below. Um, so you can show the limb soup is greater than, uh, I think it's like three, two over pi to the three something something. You, you have something in terms of the Sobolev constant. Uh, in, in terms of the sharp Sobolev constants, you can show the L3 halves norm has, the lin soup has to be bounded uh, below. But you can't show the lin soup has to be infinity. Uh, and sort of the reason is the proof of the escoriaza seragin schwerak condition is very different than the proof of the Prade-Seren and Ladezhenskaya criteria. So Ladezhenskaya Prade-Seren criterion is based on controlling uh, the, H, the L2 norm of grad u. So you, you control these scale critical quantities, you control the L2, you control the H1 norm, and the H1 norm is enough to get you regularity. The scoring as a surrogate schwerak condition is extremely technical and is based on a bunch of backward uniqueness results. Um, mm. So that, that basically you can show that if the L3 norm is bounded, then uh, you converge weakly to zero. And if there's weak convergence to zero, then you can use backward uniqueness to say that's a contradiction because zero, the zero solution is the only solution that's zero. But you can't have finite time extinction because of backward uniqueness. Um, but that involves some really, really subtle estimates on, on the behavior of semilinear heat equations. Um, and so I think it's true, but if you look at how the, the, that result's proven, the, their proof doesn't apply at all to this. Um, because we don't have backward uniqueness for the positive part of lambda 2. We only have backward uniqueness for the whole solution. Um, and so I, I suspect it's very, I, I strongly suspect it's true. I don't think you can blow up without the L3 astronaut blowing up, but I have utterly no idea how to prove it. Hmm. It's something I've thought about a little on and off, though, without. Sure, sure, sure. I mean, like, yeah.
I mean, it was like a natural question for me. So actually, there is another natural question for me that is like, you, you impose some condition on your theorem. Uh, do you have like examples for which this condition is fulfilled? This sign condition uh, oh, yeah, at yeah. initial time? Yes, so, so this is satisfied. Uh, there, are, there are initial data satisfying the condition. Uh, it's a really good point. So basically, if you take any initial data that's in H1, where minus the integral determinant's positive, and such initial data do exist, right? There's vortex stretching. So you take, basically take any initial data where there's vortex stretching. Um, if you multiply by a large enough constant, well, this will scale, like, if you replace S with C times S, this will scale like C squared, and this will scale like C cubed. So if you pick a big enough constant, there'll be, uh, you'll get into uh, this. Uh, okay, let me rephrase the question maybe. Because, uh, can you show that there is a velocity field U such that the S associated satisfies this? That, that, that's, I mean, like, not just the, not just the tensor, but like, does this tensor, this train come from some velocity field U? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, so, that, so I yeah, mean so because that's a little bit, I mean, I understand your argument, but this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's a very good question. So, so all, of the, all of the strain tensors here come from a velocity U. Um, the way we define the constraint space, um, the constraint space is the set of matrices that are the symmetric gradients of divergence free vector fields. Um, so sort of everything we're working with, um, everything we're working with is in that constraint space. So we've dropped, velocity plays no role in the equation, but we still have an associated velocity, even though we've dropped the terms involving velocity, if that makes uh -huh. sense. Um, and in particular, on the, uh, we dropped viscosity to be one, just because for simplicity's sake, but if we, if we take this viscosity to be mu, then we actually get uh, the condition just minus two mu, uh, sh.1 squared minus okay. h is the term of s. And so basically, if you take any s in h1, such that minus the integral determinant's positive, then there'll be blow up for some viscosity. Uh, okay. But if you pick a small enough viscosity, it'll blow up. Because you basically, you need to beat viscosity. And so if you fix S and H1, where there's uh, vortex stretching, <laughs> then if you pick a small enough viscosity, you'll blow up in finite time. Um, it's, uh, what's, what's not so clear is sort of the perturbative condition, right? This is, the, 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 the fact that this condition satisfied just comes down to it's, it's straightforward to beat a cubic thing with a quadratic thing. Or no, sorry, it's straightforward to beat a quadratic thing with a cubic thing. Um, the, the difficulty with this condition is, good luck calculating this. I, you know, I have no real idea where to start. I mean, I think one approach is if you wanted to work on the torus, so I was, I was mostly working on the whole space, but all the proofs apply on the torus as well. You could sort of try to minimize this quantity um, subject to, you know, on the torus, you can cut off Fourier space and you have a finite dimensional system now, right? Uh, if you truncate in Fourier space. <clears throat> the issue is you sort of, you need this nonlinear constraint. So minimizing this quantity is not hard, but you need to minimize this quantity subject <clears throat> to the constraint that this is positive, which is a bit more difficult. Hmm. Okay, thank you. Hmm. Yeah, thank you, Angel. That's a great question. Are there any other questions? I actually have more. Yeah. I don't know if we, I mean, anybody's in. I don't know about everyone else. Uh, I, I don't have anywhere so, to be. So it's, it's 12 30. People have things scheduled. They're free to go, but I, I can hang around and chat about this for as long as people want to talk. Okay, I, I, I'm curious because you, you mentioned, but I, I couldn't maybe follow, but you mentioned that there are like some conserved quantities for this S. I mean, like, this is like the first time that I see this train. So I'm curious about what kind of uh, quantities are conserved, like. Well, so it doesn't. Uh, if, if there are any. There aren't really any conserved quantities that I know of. Um, well, so if we're talking about the model equation, there aren't any conserved quantities. So we have the entropy equality, meaning that 
the 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 uh, the derivative for entropy, the differential identity for entropy is the same in uh, in the um, model equation as in the full equation, but this isn't uh, this isn't negative, right? We have we have this term as well, um, so it respects the structure of entropy growth, but it doesn't respect at all uh, any conserved quantities. Because so sort of we have conserved quantities for the strain for the whole equation, just because we uh, we sort of inherit them from u. So like the fact that the uh, L two norm of u is conserved implies the H minus one norm of strain is conserved because they're equivalent. Uh, we have an isometry that they're equivalent. That that basically <laughs> the the L two norm of grad u is equivalent to the norm of vorticity and is equivalent to the norm of strain that the symmetric and anti-symmetric parts completely determine the L2 norms. Um, and so we do have identities for the L2 norm of, uh, if we're in the Navier-Stokes equation, uh, that come from the energy equality. But that's just taking the existing ones and writing them in terms of strain and isometry. Okay, it is, it is not something very, there is nothing particular about the, the structure of this equation that you can use. You, you, you have to go like back to the other problem and then yes, extract yeah. this information from there. And, uh, exactly. So, so for instance, we know the L2 norm in time and space of the strain is finite. It's bounded by the energy because you know, the integral from zero to T of grad U L2 squared is one half the integral from zero to T of S L2 squared. Um, but that, that's it. That's all we have control over. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think the strain equation will not be useful in proving regularity. It could be useful in proving blow up. Um, but I think if, the, if yeah. there is regularity, the strain approach won't help, um, in my view. If there's blow up, I think the strain approach could help. Um, but I think you'll need different formulations for proving regularity if there is regularity. So apart from this criterion, do you have a criterion more like on S? Like some derivative of S would blow up or some norm of S would blow up instead of the eigenvalue? Like more, like yeah. if you look at the thing, yeah, no, yeah. No. so this is, uh, well, I'll say that uh, the, the Q equals infinity case of this result is exactly Biel Katomida uh, in terms of the strain. Now, it's true, you could replace lambda 2 plus with S, um, but that's sort of like strictly weaker, right? The eigenvalues are all controlled by the size of S. Um, okay. And so it's true, we do have a Biel Katomida criteria in terms of S, and in fact, uh, I think Cato proved that in terms of the strain a long time ago. Okay. Um, that that the, the, the equation in terms of vorticity can also be in terms of the strain. Um, the, the one thing I will note that's different is the Q equals infinity case only works for the Navier-Stokes equation. It doesn't work for the Euler equation. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is in the Q equals infinity case, we don't need to use the... Uh, so let me go back to the, so in the Q equals infinity case, we don't need to use the um, dissipation to get this identity, the identity holds. Uh, so this inequality holds for Euler as well when Q equals infinity, but the H1 norm doesn't control regularity for Euler. For Navier-Stokes, if we can control the L2 norm of grad U, we have a smooth solution. Uh, that's not known for Euler. It's, as of now, it's possible that you could have blow up for Euler in which the uh, H1 norm does not blow up as you approach blow up time. Um, and so over in the Euler case, uh, talking about Biel-Katomida, this holds, but this does not hold. Hmm. Okay, thank you for all the bombardment. Oh, no, no, thank you. I, thank you for answering. It was good, there's lots of questions. <laughs>